The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, folks, and uh, welcome to today's webinar. It is on penetration testing for supply chains and the role of the MSP. I'm Sophie Sayer, and I'm going to be your host today. I will introduce the panel shortly. So just before we get started, uh, a little bit of house. So, um, you will all be muted during this session that will last approximately 45 minutes, half an hour for presentation and hopefully a little bit of time at the end for Q&A. Um, ask a question, then do submit them uh, to our panelists via the chat function on this webinar. And also, just to note, we will email you a copy of the presentation slides after the recording. So, um, yeah, it will be with you in, just in case you need to uh, refer back. Okay, so uh, before I introduce the panel, just a little bit about IT governance. Um, so, we have 20 years of experience. It was our 20th anniversary just we specialize in IT governance, risk and compliance solutions. We have more than 12,000 27,001 product and service offerings, uh, which is kind of our bread and butter. 27,001 is where our business started. So the GRC International Group is comprised of several different subsidiaries. Uh, IT Governance, which is uh, where this presentation is coming from. We also have a publishing division, we have a legal division, e-learning as well, vigilance software, DQM, uh, GDPR.co.uk and CyberComply as well. So it's, it's quite a big group. Um, I'm originally from the publishing division. Uh, I spent a few years there developing books and toolkits. So uh, yeah, we, we do have a, a wealth of information across all departments. Sophie, I'm the sales director and head of channel. And I head up the channel team here at IT Governance. Uh, I've worked for the group for 15 years. Uh, like I said previously, in the publishing division, uh, where we developed toolkits on 27001, business continuity, just to name a couple. And more recently, we have been hitting the audio book industry quite hard. So uh, that's been new and exciting. Uh, but more recently, I've been heading up the channel team, which has been very exciting. Uh, since about 2019 so yeah we have about 400 MSPs on the books and it's nice to have some of you on the call with us today. Also working in channel is uh, the one and only Jason Douglas he's our global and is responsible for our partner program growth uh, and day-to-day -day sales operations he manages the partner program not only in the UK, but also at the EU and US, which is a couple of regions that we've launched only just recently. So uh, yeah, he's incredibly busy and he's been with us for four years and is absolutely a very integral part of the channel team. Most of you will probably know him on this call. So moving on um, to our speakers, we have a couple of experts here on the call today. So. James Picard is our head of security testing, uh, and Leon Teal, also senior penetration tester. Uh, both of them have a wealth of experience and knowledge, really, really are um, some of the best in the field. James has been with us for about seven years, Leon about eight years, so everyone's got a lot of experience under their belts and hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions you have today on pen testing. Um, but yeah, both of them really privileged to kind of work alongside um, and have them on, on our, on our um, open calls, etc., which we'll find a bit, a bit more a bit later. So I'm going to pass you now over to Jason, who is going to go through the agenda for today. Over to you, Jason. Thanks, Sophie. Hello, everybody. Um, so our agenda today uh, looks like... Uh, taking a closer look at the importance of addressing supply chain uh, vulnerabilities, uh, the common security challenges and questions to ask when evaluating supply chain security, um, the real world examples of supply chain breaches and their impact, the critical role uh, of MSPs in the supply chain uh, security, and how to ensure uh, you carry out effective supply chain penetration. 
then we're going to uh, analyze real world examples and look at some of the selections uh, followed by a live Q&A um, and also to set the scene when we are uh, conducting this webinar um, we have as Sophie said about 400 uh, MSP partners that we work with and a uh, large number of them uh, use us to carry out penetration tests and one of the big drivers uh, becomes uh, supply chains. Supply chains want to know that their uh, vendors and the people included within their supply chains are taking the correct security uh, precautions. And so we want to uh, continue to work with our partners um, and new partners to select the right types of penetration tests based on uh, the risks that a vendor could pose to the rest of the supply chain. So that's hopefully what we'll be up to today. Oh, thank you, Jason. I think I'll pop myself on mute. Then. <laughs> um, so, the addressing supply chain vulnerabilities is next uh, on the agenda. So, um, over to you, Jason, to to talk about uh, what is a supply chain. Sure. So, uh, just so we all have the same data level understanding uh, of what a supply chain is, it's a business. A uh, supply chain is an intricate network of processes, people, organizations, resources involved in creating, distributing and delivering products or services to end consumers. So it encompasses everything from start to finish and the key elements are uh, suppliers, manufacturers, logistics, retailers, uh, consumers collaborating to optimize cost, uh, quality and delivery. And so this is very much something that you want to keep secure, you want to keep running, and there are loads of different players who can all pose a slightly different risk based on uh, what they're doing in the supply chain. Thank you, Sophie. So uh, how to address supply chain vulnerabilities? I think it's really important to understand uh, what supply chain owners, uh, vendors and MSPs are doing uh, to look at uh, addressing vulnerabilities. So you'll have the identification of suppliers and their potential risks. Uh, you'll have the uh, implementation of uh, vendor assistance and due diligence process. You'll be trying to establish a clear security, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, roadmap or a set of requirements for supply to regularly assess and audit suppliers and security practices. Um, and the MSPs will play a key role um, if they are looking after the uh, environment or um, clients who need to be involved in these supply chains. Thank you. Um, so I'll hand over to uh, Jane and Leon uh, to talk about the impact uh, of supply chain. Thank you, Jane. So uh, slides up. So the impact of supply chains. Um, there is obviously um, potential risk of malware spreading through your supply chains. We've seen this um, in a lot of cases. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the examples later on. Um, there's also data disclosure, data breaches, so disclosure of PII, um, disclosure of um, sensitive information, business sensitive information, customers, clients, um, these sort of things. But also the biggest impact, but it's not necessarily gauged straight away, is the financial loss. Um, so on average, the cost of a data breach costs uh, 4.5 million. Obviously, this is it's not going to be applicable to a lot of our small, medium-sized customers, um, but this is a, a, going to be a big cost to you and an ongoing cost, um, not just because of the, the fines and the and the um, cost of getting yourself back up and running, but the reputational damage potentially that comes off the back of this. So um, I'm going to continue to talk about the sort of the supply chain, the source of supply chain attacks. So attackers, they can come from anywhere. Um, there are loads of different types of attackers, um, as we can see on screen. Um, and when it comes to the supply chain, it's the case of well, they're wanting to infiltrate them. So malicious insiders, they could have already got a job there. They could be employees that are wanting to split off and start their own business. They could be employees that are disgruntled and they want to affect how the business is running. Um, so that's one potential way of doing it. You've also got hundreds of threat actors that are externally facing um, websites, public facing infrastructure comes under attack um, near enough all the time. Um, and this isn't something companies should be surprised about. Um, it only takes one attack or one lucky attack to get in 
Um, so making sure you're having pen testing and regular pen testing is really important on, on your external infrastructure. National state threat actors, these probably won't affect a lot of our, our small to medium sized businesses. Um, but if you are working with key firms, sort of government, transport, um, power, these sort of things, then um, that it should be something that you should be thinking about at least and putting some protection in place anyway. Um, since COVID, there's also been a distributed workforce. Everyone works hybrid now. Are your home networks secure? Are, are employers actually thinking about the security and thinking about are they using VPNs, for example, when they're working from home? Are they encrypting their data going to the, that traffic? Um, you've also got business competitors. These are more after your either your clients or your business secrets um, and that, that they can try and disrupt, attack you through your supply chain, whether they set up a fake company or whether they are using a similar company that you are and trying to get data out of you that way. There's also insecure vendors and, and insecure or compromised software. Um, this is the trust of your supply chain. So are you trusting what, what software and what vendors you're using? Are you, are you doing your relevant checks on them as well? So um, they're sort of the sources um, of supply chains. I'm gonna pass over to Leon to talk about the, the types. Yeah, th thank, uh, thanks James. So very similar to what James was saying, there's the sources of the supply chains, but then there's uh, also the, the types of attacks and how the attacks differ when attacking the supply chains. Um, and quite a few of them, they can be grouped together. So for example, you get the counterfeit components, that, um, the risk there being either a company using cheap components or components from non-reputable sources um, that could lead to inserting fake materials or just uncertified components that will definitely compromise either the quality or the safety um, of, of the device or what it is that you're importing into. But then similarly, uh, malware injection. So if you're using, again, components or any anything from that nature that is from an untrusted or non-reputable source, then the risk there is that you can have malicious um, code injected into the software. So there's a handful of code is going to be injected into the software, which then could either cause unauthorized access into the device itself or reduce the overall integrity and safety and security of the, the device leading to disruptions or loss of data. Um, Similarly, because of the third party components and, and software, you get the third party software exploitation. So if you're using a third party software um, from another vendor, perhaps, if that vendor's software, the third party software gets compromised in any way because of insecurities with inside the, the code, then that leaves you potentially vulnerable. That could lead to unauthorized access through that system and that software into your systems which could lead to full, potentially full compromise or data loss, essentially. Um, similarly, the third party, if the vendor, if you're using a vendor that you is either providing software or you allow access into your network to provide um, different sort of um, responsibilities on your network, if that vendor is compromised in any way through multitude of different attacks, their internal network is compromised, software that they use is compromised, the data connection that they're using is not necessarily secure, then that, again, um, could lead to compromise to your network and your systems and services. So that's the importance uh, of, of ensuring that you are make, uh, the vendors that you are using are secured and verified and you keep on top and asking them, when's the last time you got tested? Um, there's things you can control. So your data, the data um, that you're sending, data in transit. So <clears throat> this is essentially data in, in interception. So if you're sending data to a third party vendor, or you're sending it to the cloud, you're sending it to your backup servers, you can at least control that side of things from, from your side. So that is the importance of encryption to prevent eavesdropping on the data um, being in transit. But specifically, it's the importance of making sure that you're doing your side and doing as best as you can, then hopefully everybody else is doing their side and you know, it gets lead to a, a secure supply chain. Um, the insider threats is similar to what, what James was saying about working from home users or people with inside the organization already. They are intending to, to do specific attacks. They are trying to bring you down. Um, so they're gonna be doing that as, as best they can. So that covers the... Um, the, the types of attack chains, essentially. Right, Thank you, Leon. Absolutely brilliant. Yeah, absolutely really, really informational. So, yeah, on to the point on today's agenda, which is common security challenges and questions to ask when evaluating supply chain security. 
so yeah, supply chain security risks arise primarily uh, from a handful of supply chain uh, security threats. Uh, as Leon and James have just been discussing with us, um, they include vendor risk, force, uh, physical threats, which Leon's just mentioned, um, and, and cyber security. So what we're looking at here is the how, the where, and why. Uh, so how do you assess and the security risks in your supply chain. Uh, we need to evidence it. Can you provide evidence? We need to measure it. So uh, what measures are in place? They could include absolutely a pen test uh, with, with the corresponding report. Uh, we need to recover uh, and also we need to plan a contingency plan in place for any disruptions which may arise. Uh, that will all help the remediation process. So some much needed questions. So I'm going to pass to Jason now. He's going to talk us through some uh, some common questions to consider. Over to you, Jason. Sure. So um, some much needed questions uh, when it comes to supply chain security, um, especially those security questionnaires. Uh, we're very fortunate to have seen hundreds of these come through the door. Um, we're very good at asking for specific language when we are quoting for pen tests or uh, any other type of uh, kind of security assessment. And so one of the kind of key questions is have uh, party uh, security reviews been performed in the organization in the last year? And there are two key points in that question. Um, uh, independent, so not marking your own homework. If you as an MSP are responsible for that end user or that vendor environment, um, making sure that there is some independence involved when you are looking at carrying out a security review. In uh, the last year, um, sometimes uh, we only see penetration testing done uh, when people enter a supply chain, but they don't do it continuously. So they get the pen test or they have the security review to enter the supply chain, but it's not something that's done uh, continuously. Um, next question is, in, is your penetration uh, testing carried out? Uh, and if so, uh, how often and to what depth? So the question, are you doing uh, penetration testing? How often? So is it just a point in time or are you doing it recurring, which you should be? Uh, and to what depth? Uh, and this is a very important piece. Um, we often see um, vendors and MSPs come through the door um, and they are looking to tick a box to enter a supply chain. Um, and we kind of push back a little bit. We have the conversation. What role is uh, that end client playing in the supply chain? Um, because if they are providing, for example, a web application, um, the external pen test won't just do. And if that web application is doing a little bit more than just being a brochure site, then we'd want to take a deeper look at the application uh, and the user levels and how the information is segregated. So um, definitely kind of pushing and, and asking um, the question about the role that that particular uh, customer plays in the supply chain to then work out the right type of test. Um, another question is, uh, have critical remediated or do you have a plan? So again, we see uh, a pen test carried out uh, one year and the next year, the same vulnerabilities we found the year before uh, are still active. So there hasn't been a plan, hasn't been remediation. So retesting and working out a plan, uh, and that's something that our pen test team are really good at helping uh, clients do, is working out a plan to fix the problems uh, in a timely manner. Um, the next question is, uh, is your compliance status current and in line uh, with requirements? Um, we get people through the door who have one business and got access to a supply chain, but they require compliance. Um, and so they have to try and rush to get compliance to make sure that they are uh, in line with requirements of that supply chain. Um, our MSPs are, are really great at the moment, especially our top partners, in having the conversation around industry um, and around uh, the current uh, kind of compliance pieces that are relevant to those industries and trying to get their clients to be a little bit more proactive so they're not coming through the door after winning a deal or after entering a supply chain, then looking for compliance, but they're doing it beforehand because it's an industry expectation. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you, Jason. Brilliant. Um, so now we're going to actually look at uh, one of my favourite parts of the webinar, which is real world examples of supply chain breaches and uh, the impact. Of I think Leon's going to do the first, um, yeah, some first examples here. So I'll pass to you, Leon, so that you can uh, talk about these real world examples. Over to you. OK, thanks again, Sophie. So what I've done here is I picked a one example from each of the past, I think maybe around three years, um, ones you'll probably be familiar with, or maybe not, but hopefully you can learn something from this. <clears throat> so back in 2021, the Log4j, the Logjam vulnerability. So what this was, it was a piece of software that uh, companies 
uh, using to, to for, for logging purposes, but it was vulnerable to a particular remote code execution attack. So what's happening is attackers is able to send a malicious code string um, with their request to the server, and then uh, that's able that allows them to take control of the device. In short, so, but that does affect it affects a lot of companies. You know, Apple, Cisco, Google, Amazon, and even through to gaming servers like Minecraft, which particularly takes hold because um, people have those at home, in their home environment, the kids are running them. So the, the vulnerability affects everywhere. Now, similar to what James was saying before about sources of these attacks, there was actually known nation state backed uh, hackers from like China, North Korea, Turkey, they were all known for trying to exploit this uh, within other nations. So uh, how do you check for it? How do you know if you've got it? Um, basically check, are you using Log4j? You either ask your IT guys, you know, the, see what, see if you're running that. And specifically, are you running the known vulnerable version? Obviously update it if you are. However, a pen test will pick this up as standard. That's why the pen tests are important. Obviously it's after the fact. We don't find zero day vulnerabilities, um, but we will identify this when doing any normal pen test. Uh, in 2022, uh, 3CX, this is an interesting uh, export essentially. So a previous supply chain was compromised and that compromised the whole supply chain, which then affected another supply chain. So 3CX, an employee of this company, downloaded some software. Um, and essentially that software infected their, their company and then that infection affected their update server. So the software that they're then providing affected the update server so that when all the customers and all the people using it the end clients they update the software they then pull down the malicious and vulnerable code themselves as well so this is a this is an example of a supply chain compromising another supply chain which then compromises the end users um so this is very interesting this was back in 2022 um it affected about 12 million customers which include a range from aerospace to healthcare to hospitality so it's very important to obviously keep your name out of the national papers essentially um and then in 2023 the move it so the recent one from this year so move it is a managed essentially a managed file transfer uh, software it's very similar to like share file and what happened here is there was a vulnerability in the code that allowed attackers to gain sql injection so sending a you know, a, a malicious query again uh, to the software allow them to to get full access into into the system. So this allows them to gain access to the data that's stored within it. They can export data, they can manipulate uh, the data within it. They they can deploy ransomware. They can they can elevate their privileges. Um, so this is the importance. So this affected BBC. Uh, even ironically, Norton got affected by this same vulnerability. So if you're using a third party solution. Um, or, or software, and that gets compromised, and it's storing your data or using it to store your data. It just goes to show that you could be as secure as you can be from your side. But if if everybody in the chain is not it is not as secure as you, not necessarily not doing their part, but not as secure as you, then your data is still at risk. Um, and it's not just your data; it's everybody who uses you as a service and a provider. So that's down. That was back in 2023 this year. Thank you, Leon. Brilliant. Yeah. And just to kind of add for those of you on the call, um, I, I, I'm a parent, as I'm sure lots of you are. And so those examples really do hit home, don't they, when Leon talks about things like Minecraft and, and uh, programs that can be accessed on, on various um, gaming, uh, you know, uh, facilities and stuff. So really useful and hopefully lots of you can relate. So next up. MSPs in supply chain security. So, um, Jason, is this your slide? Over to you. It is. Yes, it is. So, um, best practice to counter supply chain. So, um, expert uh, assessments uh, and continual assessments, and so not just point in time, um, but periodically uh, running uh, assessments, maybe even putting in uh, an independent third party to show up the work that you're doing in MSP for your end clients um, and for your own supply chain uh, as well, just for a fresh pair of eyes and some independency. Uh, vendor evaluation, so um, just not letting anybody um, supply you and be within your uh, supply chain, being a little bit picky uh, and asking those tough questions we talked about. Uh, continuous monitoring, MSPs are great at that, they've got some great solutions and tools, monitoring. Um, but again, just making sure it's not uh, only a point in time. 
Um, cyber incident response. Um, so again, um, we look at this at IT governance uh, quite a lot. And um, this comes down to, uh, do you have a cyber incident response policy? Um, and do you have an accompanying playbook with different scenarios, whether it be a, a ransomware, for example? Um, and compliance guidance. Um, so we've all seen uh, uh, some of these questionnaires that come through um, and some of the questions are asked, uh, that are asked by supply chains. And they might uh, say, uh, do you have ISO 27001 or do you have Cyber Essentials Plus? If so, please skip through the next 14 questions because it's giving that supply chain some reassurance um, that you're doing the right things. Uh, and it's within a standard of framework uh, that will be recognised uh, either domestically or internationally. Um, so uh, if there are uh, those repeat questions coming up around compliance, um, you know, look at a framework uh, so it makes your life a little bit easier when it comes to um, supporting your supply chains. Thank you, Jason. Brilliant. Yeah, we're doing okay the slides so hopefully we should have enough for, for questions at the end like I said at the beginning if anybody wants to ask anything then do pop your questions in the chat um, so that we can look at them over the next five or ten minutes uh, just while we finish the presentation make sure you carry out effective supply chain penetration tests uh, James this is yours yeah so I think the most important step is the actual scoping itself so making sure that you understand your scope and making sure you understand what is expected of you. We have clients in the past that have come to us, we've delivered them a penetration test, and then they come back to us and gone, that's not what my inspired, that's not what my uh, client was looking for. And it's really important to get that validation to ensure that um, you are delivering what the right pen test is. Getting your understanding of your systems is really important as well. So making sure you are covering the whole scope of systems, not just one part of it. So if, you, if you've got a web application, for example, making sure that you test your external infrastructure as well, that that sits on, because that gives you more of a complete picture of what you're testing. Um, and being able to transfer this information onto the testing team. So being open and honest with us is really important. Um, and talking about your solution in a little bit more detail. Um, we are here to help you guys. We're not here to trick you guys. We want to know your information because that assists us in pen testing. Um, when you try evade us and be a little more secretive, it, it makes it a little, our job a little bit more difficult because you need to, when we're scoping, because we want to understand what you're trying to achieve. Um, so the following steps um, carry on from this. So the scoping is obviously the base of it. This makes sure that the pre-engagement call, we cover the right topics, we get the right information, we are and testing the right thing. Um, so when we come to testing, we are up and running for the testing. The pre-engagement call should cover everything you need for testing to go successfully. Um, we'll also be in constant communication with you guys. So if you do our pen test with us, we will be highlighting critical and high vulnerabilities straight away to you. So you can either fix them yourselves um, or you can evaluate how um, how serious they are, whether they need that instant fix or whether you can um, delay the, the, the fix of that. Um, we'll also debrief you. So with the debrief, what we'll do is we'll give our expert opinion on the test itself. We're not, not necessarily talk about all the vulnerabilities we find, but we'll give our opinion on, well, you've got a critical, but actually this medium is going to cause you a lot more issues than the critical. Um, and then you can apply your own information and your own risk matrix to these vulnerabilities that we, we then report on. Um, when we do our testing, it goes through a quality assurance process. So this will go under a peer review, technical review, management review. So when you do get a report, it should be really clear and easy to understand. It should address both executive and technical members of staff um, to make sure they get the most out of the report. Um, when you are in a supply chain and you're asking for proof of um, testing or proof that you have done testing, um, we don't just provide your report. I mean, that's great, um, but you are disclosing a lot of your technical information, a lot of the vulnerability and how to repeat these issues. Um, so if you are part of supply chain and you want an executive summary report, which will cover risk, then that is what we can provide on top of it, as well as um, a letter of attestation, if you want, just saying we've had a pen test. On this day, it's covered X, Y, Z, and we found X number of vulnerabilities. Um, and that's not where the service finishes as well. So you've got the aftercare. So if you do receive the port report and you can't get a proof of concept working or you can't recreate the vulnerability that we found, uh, we, we're more than happy to come back and help you guys recreate this or tell you how to how to identify this as well. Um, 
But the final step, um, which is retesting, which is not often covered by a lot of, lot of people. Um, yes, it's great. You may be relying on the third party to do your, to your, to do your fixing, to do your issues. Um, taking their word that they've done doesn't really give you this, this, the necessary satisfaction that it is secure. Uh, mm -hmm. We've seen lots of times where they have um, fixed the issue. Let's say they put a password policy in place, um, but then they've not required the, then they've changed the way the password mechanism works and um, you've, you've missed this vulnerability. There's a, in, they've introduced a new vulnerability into the system. Um, so covering those. Um, Leon, is there anything else that you'd like to add to that? I, I think you covered the last point I was just about to make, the, the, the unwritten step of the retest, uh, yeah. just how important it is. So, um, no, you saved me, you saved me some words then. <laughs> Thanks, James. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah, really good slide. Um, actually, just to kind of uh, recreate the, the scoping part of the uh, the steps, I mean, I know that's often here at IT Governance, uh, as account managers, we do like to join our, our pen testers on their scoping calls so that we are with uh, our partners or end clients sort of every step of the way just to provide that continuity um, and just, yeah, just to keep you all informed um, as we go through the process. So really, really, really good. Thank you, Leon and James. Uh, so moving through then, we are now going on to analyse real world examples um, and product selection. Uh, so now we have a couple of scenarios for you here. Um, so who wants to take the first one? I'll take the first one. Um, Jason, will you do the setting for me, please? Yeah, of course, of course. So um, as one of the account managers at IT Governance, uh, I get calls uh, every other day from uh, an MSP um, who needs to arrange a pen test for their clients. So uh, this particular end client uh, is going to be looked after by a smaller MSP. Um, web application um, and the end client uh, is a startup travel portal a web app and they've sold it to another client but they require some pen testing so I'm going to take that brief to uh, to James and I'm going to give him the information that I've collected and he's going to uh, recommend for this uh, lovely travel portal uh, the right type of pen test to give that supply chain some reassurance so James what do you uh, what do you recommend Okay, so um, there's lots of different steps in here. So the end client is obviously a business user. Um, they're obviously going to have multiple, or potentially multiple people in their organization using this platform. Um, you're going to have multiple levels of your users potentially within the travel portal. So you're going to have users that book and users that approve and manage at a minimum. Um, so a lot of clients come to us and they'll be like, we would just want to do an authenticated pen test. Okay, that's great. You want to do an authenticated pen test that will only protect people coming into the org, trying to get into the application. What happens if business A has a rogue or a rogue member of staff that are already inside the application? Can user B, uh, company A, access company B's data through this application? And this is a vulnerability that's becoming more and more common in, in what we identify it is lack of internal access controls. So we would recommend that we would do an authenticated test because untrusted users are using the company's travel portal. Um, we'd also recommend that you set up two companies for us to test across um, company A and company B to, to cover vertical um, privilege escalation and then horizontal. So we make sure we have an admin as well. If you guys, if the travel portal has a, a super admin or an admin which is internally facing, we probably recommend that um, we would do privilege escalation to that level to make sure that um, basic users or approving users can't access admin or trusted functionality within the application. Um, but to further secure the supply chain, we'll be looking further up the process. So we can see here the MSP um, is hosting web applications for the client. So um, they're obviously hosting on some external infrastructure. Has the MSP done some external infrastructure testing, either across their across their whole scope or specifically against this application? So, is where the data is being stored and, and held secure? Um, so that's an important question for them to ask, and they can request a, a pen test report for that potentially or uh, uh, evidence of of that. Um, another thing with travel portals, they often use APIs, so they often use comparison websites um, and other websites to. to pull information back to get the best price um, for, for, the, for the business end user. Um, so it's important that they'll be using um, 
APIs to access this information. Um, so has the the the, the company, the, the booking company, um, had an API test? So requesting and seeing what information you're actually transferring up there. If you're putting up there, it's one person and the dates that they want to stay. Okay. But if you're putting up there their names, their emails, if it's a flight system, are you putting their passport information? Are you passing this sensitive information up your supply chain? Um, so validating um, that each step has done the right pen test is, is really important. Thank you, James. Shall we move on to scenario two? Yeah. Okay, awesome. um, Jason, Jason, do you want to set the scene for us? Yeah, okay, so we've got many partners doing various uh, different things. Um, so this one's a, an IT service provider hosting a web app, uh, but this time for uh, a law firm's data. So uh, a lot more high profile, um, they're handling customers uh, confidential data, uh, it requires uh, frequent pen testing for compliance purposes. Um, so uh, for this law firm, Leon, uh, what would you suggest uh, pen testing? Sure, so working from the, the bottom up, so the end client, so if, you, if you're, a client of a law firm and inherently you are you are expecting them to have an increased security posture just from the get-go so you expect a lot more from your law firm so as the law firm specifically they're the ones that are processing all this data obviously that they're taking it they're obtaining it either digitally um and then you would expect them to have to have an external pen test you know very similar to what james has already covered you got your external pen test from their external uh, footprint from online, but then you would have the internal network tested and wireless as, as, a, as a typical corporation, uh, they often have wireless communications. You want to get a wireless assessment too. Um, if you're a law firm, you, you don't want other, and it might be a shared building, you might just be around other places where people can attack your wireless network without even entering your building. So you need to make sure you've got the sufficient segmentation between uh, guest and corporate um, or to make sure you're using the right protocols and security procedures to stop people getting to your corporate internet um, and corporate internal network you would want your bills review so this is uh, different to the other one uh, other scenario that james was uh, saying so the build review is because these machines are processing your data they're taking and, and inputting all your information you want to make sure those those machines themselves are secure um, that is more than just an Intel pen test where you check is everything patched and up to date, but are they following extended guidance um, and protocols to be able to help secure your data? And phishing is quite important. So phishing it, uh, is the company, the law firm, susceptible to a, a phishing attack? Are they going to be tricked into giving your data away, um, typically via email? But then it doesn't stop there. So then you've got the next step in the chain. So the law firm then uses a managed service provider and the managed service provider is storing all this data that the law firm collects. They're hosting the website for the law firm, but they're also storing all this data of the end users and the, and the clients. So then the MSP is uh, subject to external pen testing uh, around the environment of which is storing your data. The internal network that your data is sat on should then be subject to internal network pen testing. Um, obviously, you need you wanting to get proof of all these all the way down, all the way through the chain. Everyone should be aware of each other's posture. Then you got the web and API, similar to what James was saying, because there's websites involved, so you need to make sure you cover those. But also the social engineering side for the MSP as well. And the MSP is going to be tricked into thinking they're communicating with um, the law firms or their customers. But then it's not just the phishing side. They what about the visitors? physical security if they're storing your data on the servers on in an in-house data center what's the physical security like and that's often a big part that's overlooked it's all it's all good and well and you've got firewalls preventing people uh, even in the uk or all the countries breaching and gaining access and getting access to your data if that's nice and secure but then somebody else can just walk in either talk to you or evade completely a receptionist walk into the offices plug in their devices a rogue device or on or their, or their laptop do some you know hacking into them and then getting out it's all good and well having all these bells and whistles throughout from the outside but if your phys physical security is not up to par um it's just as bad as having the outside open as well so th there's a lot more steps than and essentially products um from the suite of all the pen testing tools that you want to be applying um obviously you can apply these to the smaller firms and smaller scenarios but uh, the importance of all this is do the one that's right for you essentially you don't need everything. Not everybody needs everything, but you need to be making sure you're covering what is right. And that circles right back through to what James was saying, scoping. 
the scoping, the scoping, the scoping. It's, it's so important to know what you have and to understand what the customer has, um, or the MSP, or the clients, or even the end user, what the aim is. Um, so yeah, I, I think that pretty much covers that scenario. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, I, I think just James. to summarize that, um, basically we put these two examples together because we want to show the differences between having a high profile client, high profile risks, to a much lower um, sort of more standard accounts. So if, if you are dealing with high value, high end customers and, and new contracts are with larger organizations, they do expect more from you. They, they are wanting to see more from you. And it's always better to be in a position um, that you've already done the pen test and you can provide it rather than trying to request it at a last minute stage. Absolutely. Thank you, James and Leon. Um, and just to kind of add, penetration testing is is indeed one of our top selling products in channel, um, as is Cyber Essentials and PCI. So um, it's, it's very, very popular. And that kind of, um, it's, I know time's ticking on a little bit. So I'll just go through, just while you're getting your last questions in the chat, folks, if that's okay. Um, I'll just move on to the ways that you can get in touch. As you can see on the screen here, we've obviously got our website. Um, you can email us, call us, and we do a lot on social media. Um, so you can you can follow us on social and there's daily updates on there from our marketing team. So, yeah, just to kind of say thank you and move on to some of the questions. Um, the, the first question I have in, I think we've probably got time for, for one or two. I know we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, so the first one is uh, probably for Lee. Um, it's been mentioned in this presentation, Jason, that we should have regular pen tests uh, for our kind of cybersecurity defense in depth. Uh, how often would you recommend that your clients have their pen test. Sure, was that a question for me, Sophie? Sorry. Yes, please, Jason. Yeah. Sure. So, um, a lot of our, our partners and their clients, a lot of these supply chains, uh, normally request uh, annual uh, penetration testing, um, and that is definitely better than doing uh, no penetration testing. Um, but again, based on risk, if we're finding and you're needing quite a lot of uh, retesting, putting together a schedule where you can periodically um, tackle those vulnerabilities um, makes a lot of sense. So I think uh, minimum yearly, but if we are finding vulnerabilities, getting those retests booked in, making sure if we're finding new vulnerabilities, again, continuing and maybe getting a schedule together until we have a way of, uh, you know, um, getting those vulnerabilities a little bit quicker and continual, uh, scanning might be uh, useful as well. It's also important to do it after sort of major changes. So if you have made a change two or three months down the line, getting either those changes made as a spot or a focus test or having the whole application tested again is really important because essentially you've changed your security structure. You're not in the same position as you were two months ago. Um, Perfect. Leon, have you got anything to add to that one? Uh, no, I think that was pretty well covered. You know, uh, uh, requirements such as PCI, etc. They all mandate those changes. You know, if you make the specific changes or significant changes to a network uh, or similar, then you have to get tested. So they they apply it for a rule uh, for a reason. Sorry, and I think it's a good um, I think it's a good rule to to stick to. Perfect. Yeah, good good habits to get into. I'm sure. Um, and also just to kind of add in, in do you sort of reach out to our customers if their annual review. Um, it's uh, yeah, sometimes uh, quite handy to have a couple of uh, you know notifications if, if, a, if a pen test is, is due. I know a lot of uh, my accounts in particular do have retests with us annually. So um, yeah, really, really good, good habits. Um, I'm pretty much out of time. It's, it's nearly quarter two. We've been running for 45 minutes, as we said we were going to. If, uh, if there's a like, questions coming in, if we haven't got back to you this afternoon uh, live on this webinar, what we'll do is, as a team, we will collate all the questions and answers to try and get you all the, the help uh, that you need. Uh, but yeah, just, just to say, on behalf of myself and the excellent panel today, thank you to James and Leon and Jason for joining us, and uh, we wish you a lovely weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys.